Thousands of years ago, in a series of ice ages when glaciers covered much of North America, Northern Europe, and Siberia, low sea levels exposed a vast land now called Beringia that extended hundreds of miles northward and southward from the present-day Bering Strait. It was a bridge connecting Asia and the North American continent. The land bridge was still in existence around 10,000 years ago, and it probably uh, finally got submerged by about 9,800 years ago. Uh, it's possible that uh, some sort of memory of this event would be preserved in legends. A mother's son was killed by a seal, so she took her knife, skinned the seal alive, and threw it back into the sea. The seal king punished her by causing a great flood. The water rose higher and higher until the village was completely covered by the sea. To this day, the destroyed village is beneath the sea. Only two hills stand above the water, and these are the islands of Big Diomede and Little Diomede. As glaciers and large continental ice caps melted in warm periods between the ice ages, the bridge would flood and disappear as the ocean rose. When sea levels were low, the exposed land was similar to what remains today, a mosaic of tundra plain and marshes, rich foraging for the bridge's wildlife which traveled back and forth. Near the close of the last ice age, hunter-gatherers followed the game. Some stayed in the New World, rapidly colonizing the Americas to the tip of South America. They became the ancestors of today's North and South American Indians. Later, the ancestors of the Aleuts and Eskimos would follow. Today, the bridge is again flooded. There are 53 miles of ocean separating the old world of Russia from the new world of Alaska. But the migrations continue, this time through the skies and seas. Millions of migrating birds cross the bridge in both directions to nest and fatten on the summer tundra. Bowhead, gray whales, and other sea mammals also migrate between the Pacific and Arctic Oceans through the rich feeding grounds of the Bering Strait. The Seward Peninsula of Alaska, the islands of the Bering Strait, and the Chukchi Peninsula of Siberia are parts of the land bridge that remain above the sea. The people who live here are the Inupiaq and Yupik Eskimo of North America and the Yupik Eskimo and Chukchi of Siberia. And they go trading. The lives of elders such as Gideon and Bessie Bar Cross bridge the gap between ancient and modern lifeways of their people. They are historians, keepers of their culture. They don't make that too much down there. My name is Gideon K. Bar. My Eskimo name is Kaluk. Bessie Bar was my maiden name. I was born at Cape Espenberg, 19, March 11, 1921, and um, I wasn't born in the hospital. <laughs> I was born at home. I was born July 21, 1917. I was born right back in here, right back here. And I grew up with my father. Yeah, my father is from Ketapar. I've always seen Gideon as a uh, native scholar. Uh, scholarly instincts, they're really genetic. You, they're not a product of going to school for years and years. He showed me how, how the world was forming up, forming up higher and higher. He can guess pretty much just how long it takes to build that high, from dust to dust. I can imagine that if I were born as Shishmarif, th that I'd be a person much like Gideon. I'd, I'd be driven as he is. I am driven by uh, what seems to me a, just a compelling necessity for me to uh, preserve knowledge. Ancient sediments tell us about the people who lived during the past 12,000 years on both sides of the land bridge and who shared many of the same traditions and lifestyles. Because of the scientific and cultural value of Beringia, the Bering Land Bridge National Preserve was established in 1980.
Plans are underway to create a United States and Russian Beringian Heritage International Park. It will unite a new Russian park in Siberia with the United States National Parks in Northwest Alaska. This international park will preserve on both sides of the flooded land bridge the long record of past and changing landscapes and biotas, along with the archaeological sites, cultural traditions, and lifestyles of its people. A pair of mittens. In the days when Cape Espenberg was just a floating ground and the deep water flowed underneath it, the mother of the great hunter Ilaganik heard that her son had been killed. She decided to get even with those who killed him and punish all people. She made this ground shallow so no whales could travel through it by filling up her mitten with sand and throwing it into the ocean. The sand spilled out, creating sandbars and beaches. Now the tip of Espenberg is all solid ground and shallow. Iluganuk was a great hunter who killed a big whale from his kayak and placed its skull and jawbone near his home at the tip of Cape Espenberg. That whale he caught looked kind of big to him, and he didn't think that he would get that size of whale again. So he decided to, well, if I put the head up on the mainland and one side of a jawbone, and so my ancestors would believe that I got that whale that size from my, from my kayak. That's why he left that uh, whale head behind. The Western Brook was a real close place to hunt sea mammal in springtime. And that's why uh, my father's ancestors were living there from generation to generation. It is a vast territory rich with good hunting, fishing, and food gathering sites, supporting native people for over 10,000 years. I'm glad about my good hunting days. My father taught me how to hunt, and I have to pass it on to my kids. He said, you got to learn how to use a seal net, fish net, snares, all of those things like that. The women were the ones that go and get the wood while the men are out uh, ugruk hunting and seal hunting. And we take care of these things by dog team and there was no snow machines, no nothing in. When I get to be an active hunter, I realize that I gotta have dog feet on hand. So I will try to hunt all of my food for dog feet and, and for us. So, as long as I put away eight walruses, I always feel safe. I got enough dog feet for the winter now. Dogs do a lot of work for us. It's part of a family. We do things as a group. The one who has a lot of ugru to cut than their neighbors who have less to do would come over and help them. And it isn't just the meat and blubber we eat. We preserve a lot of vegetables, greens that we pick from the earth. You have to watch what goes. Like sura, and we pick sour docks, berries. They watch the land. The land helped them for food. They put away anything that is edible for the coming winter. That's the way our ancestors was, uh, was raised. <clears throat> Before white man food time, they have a mighty tough time sometimes. People, some people starving even. But so far, my ancestors, they, they say, they all been doing fine. 
The Inupiaq ancestors lived with the land and the animals. There was no hierarchy with the people at the top ruling lesser life forms. There were no boundaries between animal spirits, human spirits, and the spirits of nature. All were respected equally and were part of the same life force. They put all the bones together. They burn it up when the wind is lightly blowing from south. And that means any animal that was taken from the ocean to the shore, when they're done with it, they send us, they send the soul out back to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's what the, that's what my father believed. It's from the ancestors, from, from our ancestors. <laughs> and then from that, the animals say they take good care of our uh, remains, and we go back and be caught by them again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the main point. <laughs> I know my father, always just hunt what you can take care of. Never waste it. If you have to, if you happen to hunt more than, more than you can take care of right now, bury some of them underground. That'll keep for winter use, either for dogs or for the human. We have to learn all that from our Ancestors. Water covering the land bridge is easily provoked into angry storms. They tear at the homes and burial grounds of Gideon and Bessie's ancestors. Oh, yeah. Gideon and Bessie, with Russian and American scientists and scholars, work together in a National Park Service research effort called the Shared Beringian Heritage Program. They document as much of the cultural and natural heritage as they can. And then they Gideon's memories it. begin in the early 1920s. These last years, facts and events carefully preserved in his mind spill out onto the pages, recorders, and cameras of scholars. They race to capture fragments from another time before the waters take them. That trail head is still there at the point. My father and his brother, Shubla, I think they roll it up twice when it gets so close to a place where it's eroding down before it fell down. They want the ancestors to keep on seeing it. Part of Gideon and Bessie's early childhood was spent in Ublison, Crack of Dawn, an old seal hunting site west of Cape Espenberg on the coast of the Chukchi Sea. It became a reindeer herder's winter village in the early 1920s when the tundra moss was overgrazed at Cape Espenberg. Ublison and other coastal sites are rapidly eroding and will be gone in a short time. Remnants of house and cache structures used nearly 200 years ago are all that remain. Most traces of its earlier occupations are now lost to the sea. We lose a lot of land out here. We lose a lot of land from erosion. The old site that was built way ahead of us, which the history we don't even hear about. There's an old house someplace right here. It's right up here. Gee, real hard to trace this old building. Must have been pretty old. They dig yeah, a hole first, huh? Huh? They dig a hole. Yeah. According to what they tell us, towards the sun, there's a window. What was it made out of? Ugluk intestines sewed together. And on this main frame of the work, there's a rawhide snare tied up into that log main, on the main frame. So when the bear starting to reach down with, uh, with his arm. Through the window? Through the window, all they do is just open that snare and let his arm go through and tighten it. And there he's tied up for good. They go out and use bow and arrow or spears to kill it. All the old houses along here are gone. Oh, to yeah. To the ocean, aren't they? Uh, uh, but these are new old houses over here. Shublux is last one. Umel. James Moyes and his dad, 
Edred and his brother, and Peter Barr, and Lloyd uh, Kunduk, Gordon Dimmick, and us. Gideon's ancestors waged war and traded with their neighbors on both sides of the Bering Strait. More war than trade took place until the 1700s, but then trade became more important. Tobacco from South Carolina was introduced to Alaska in the 1770s by the Chukotka traders. It had traveled from America through Europe and Siberia to get back to the New World. Then the Eskimos of the Bering Strait, Chukotka, and the Seward Peninsula soon became the principal middlemen in a valuable trade route that wove its way from the Mackenzie River in Canada to Siberia, the back door to Moscow and Europe. We found this here eroding from the old part of the site, which looks like a Chukchi snuff box, maybe traded from an earlier time. Yeah, probably. It's very rare to find a piece like that. Trade increased early in the 19th century when the first exploring, trading, and whaling ships arrived, lured by the promise of enormous profits. Gideon's family lived in Cape Espenberg. Isolated from the larger trading centers, he didn't see his first white man until the mid-1920s, when he was five years old. First time I hear white men talking, and he said, all he do is talk about dollars and hundreds. That, those, those two what I learned first, white men were, because that was the first time I've seen a white man talking but never understand the word. But he always say, ah, uh, hundreds of dollars. Ships from exotic ports began to sail the Bering Strait, and trouble soon followed. By the 1870s, sea mammal slaughter, the collapse of the caribou herd, and diseases brought by the traders resulted in native hardship and starvation. Alaska's purchase from Russia brought changes to the Eskimo way of life by introducing a new economy from reindeer herding, missions, and schools. Reindeer herding was a traditional lifestyle for the Chukotka Eskimos at the other end of the bridge, but it wasn't introduced to Alaska Eskimos until 1892 by missionaries and teachers to prevent periodic famine and to bring civilization to the Eskimos. I uh, had to take care of the reindeers when I grew up to be old enough, somebody got to be with the herd day and night. I like it. You, you could use to just like a, the way I feel. It's yeah, just like part of my family. They go so many, maybe 275,000, and Seward Peninsula was too small when they get into that number. And then the, the moss is eaten out, and most of it is covered with snow, too deep. So that's when they starved out. I was nine years old when I walked into school. And my father had to walk me out of school when I was 13 years old. As I was studying in school, in my desk, somebody tapped me on my shoulder. I look, and he, he was my father. He said, son, he talking Eskimo. Son, he won't become a teacher. If you learn how to take care of yourself by subsistent hunting, you won't go hungry. You'll be much safer because the school won't let you learn how to how to live like I do. He said, "I hate to leave school just when I get good interested to go on to school for." higher grades. We did not have any three R's or whatever. And then they wondered, how, how did you learn to speak in English? And I said, we had to learn it from 
uh, the children. In 1899, when gold was discovered in Nome, the tempo of change increased. As Shishmaref became a supply center, opportunities for seasonal employment drew people from smaller villages to the larger communities. 1939, I was hired as a laborer at the gold mine. That was the first time I ever earned money. And we were getting paid in those days. 54 cents an hour. And 10 hours a day. I worked in Nome during the Second World War uh, as a waitress in uh, the restaurant, not because I wanted to, and I lived there for a while and eat off the restaurant. And during that Second World War, we had a lot of uh, Russian pilots go through Nome. Um, they were uh, transporting uh, airplanes from the state side. They hardly talk in English, you know, and of course we did not have very many interpreters, and then we feed them bacon and eggs and hash brown potatoes and coffee. We never think to give them tea, I guess, why we don't know. <laughs> there was one guy, he says, okie doke. So we nicknamed him as an okie doke. <laughs> After the gold mine shut down, job was getting so scarce and I went to Cotterville, moved to Cotterville. Then I started longshoring. Coast Guard gave me a, a test and see if I would pass as a captain, licensed captain. Boy, I was really shaky because I didn't have that much school. <laughs> There's a lot of words that I can't even pronounce or don't even know what they mean. <laughs> and he, she handed it to me. I read it. Captain Green K. Bar. <laughs> I was so proud. <laughs> uh, I sure had a relief that I'm a captain now. <laughs> Life oh, <is> captain. <laughs> Villages such as Shishmaref are now modern communities. Much has changed with 200 years of Western contact. But the bonds between the spirits of animals, humans, and nature link Alaska natives to the subsistence way of life. Urban people think uh, humans are intruders, that we must absolutely protect wild nature from uh, any kind of manipulation by humans. Uh, the result is a pressure against allowing the people to pursue their subsistence lifestyle. They're the ones that have money to go by, and us we don't have. Now we have to go out and hunt and survive. They don't see that. They have no sense of seeing that at all. That's something that I don't like. One thing I didn't think about was the possible impact on local people. You know, I was thinking, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, we have this great, enormous area set aside for scientific research. And uh, uh, one of the gaps in my thinking was, yeah, but this great, huge area is the uh, subsistence area that uh, uh, belongs much more to the people of Shishmarif and. Uh, Daring than it does to me or any other scientist. Change is a daily part of life in Beringia. The change of seasons, the change of weather, food sources decline in one area and increase in another. Life begins, life ends. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. Many of the old villages scattered along the Bering Strait coast are lost to the sea. And now the sea reaches out to claim Shishmaref. When I first started 
coming down here in Chishma, that school used to be way back up here. But now, eroding away. Now they have to try to put seawall and all that stuff to protect the village. Because it's eroding away. That's something that I can see that they lost a lot of land on the beach. Big storms like fault time, that what hurts the land. With the melting of the ice curtain between Russia and the United States, families and friends on each end of the Bering Land Bridge are no longer kept apart. Today, people cross the Bering Strait striving to renew commercial and cultural ties. A dramatic monument to this era of peace and reunion will be the Beringian Heritage International Park, protecting the history of the land and people, preserving lifeways, species, and gene pools, and protecting the spectacular beauty and richness of life of the Bering Strait and land of the Bering Land Bridge. The challenge will be to include the needs and desires of the people who live on both sides of the bridge honoring their traditional lifestyles and dreams for the future. Native people feel a very organic relationship to the land. Uh, it nurtures them. They commonly have some feeling that they must take care of it. When it's eroded away, that's when you prove it, where the people live or where people never been lived. The old sites, what I can see, they eroded away, washed out clean. Got no way to prove that someone had been living there before, in earlier days, before our time, before our parents' time. All those places have eroded away. The land, if you take care of it, it teaches you to take care of yourself. <laughs>